Hey everybody, today we are debating, is there evidence for young earth creationism? And we're starting right now. Hey friends, stoked to have you here for this really interesting uh, war of worlds, you know, uh, gentlemen crossing over into different worlds. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're excited to have you here. And we are not going to waste time. We're going to get right to it. So first, I want to make, uh, make a, a point to say we would love for you to be here, whether you're a Christian, atheist, uh, Jedi, Sith, no matter who you are, we are a neutral channel, and we want to welcome people from all walks of life. So with that, feel free. Consider hitting that subscribe button as we are excited for upcoming debates. And now I want to introduce our speakers. So... Destiny on your left in the main view is not only, uh, you could say, I think it would be fair to say, I, I think you told me atheist at the uh, earlier on, Destiny, right? Yeah, we'll say agnostic atheist, sure. That's where, okay. I'm flexible with that. And uh, Kent Hovind, as you know, is a Christian, and they're debating, is there evidence for Young Earth today? Destiny is a popular streamer, and... He is on Twitch as well as YouTube, and both of his links are down in the description. So if you're like, hey, I really enjoy listening to this, well, you can reach out to him there or see more of his content. Also, Kent Hovind, uh, glad to have you back again. And uh, as mentioned, Kent is a Christian, and he is a young creationist. He will be arguing today for that position, and his links are down in the description. So if you enjoy his content, you want to know more about, I think it's Dinosaur Adventure Land, right? Yes, sir. You bet. That is down in the description box, and so you can check out their content. So thank you both for being here. It's a, it's a joy to have you. And Shannon Q, down in the bottom right, glad to have you. Thanks so much for being here. She is going to be – I just – I'm so scattered today. Forgive you, everybody. I'm linking her in the description right now. Uh, shame. For yeah. shame. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> it's uh, – she is uh, just one of the more congenial people, and she's also uh, one of the people that I trust very deeply. She's an atheist, but uh, I promise that <laughs> between her, <laughs> it wasn't meant to say, like, you know, I trust her, I don't trust her, but, but she, she's, yeah. uh, she's, we're going to run a fair deal here between the two of us, uh, and so we are thrilled to have everybody here. Shannon, I will hand it over to you to do the format in just a second. I want to mention the last thing that I almost always forget. Anybody who has a question during the debate can put at modern day debate in the live chat. That helps me see it. And I'm going to collect all of your questions from the live chat and I will put them into the list that we will ask during the Q and A. Uh, and I would encourage you to get them in early. We got a short and sweet debate today. So Shannon with that, thanks so much for helping moderate today. And the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the debate. Just a quick point of order before we get started. Our format today is going to be eight minutes of opening statements from each participant, five minute rebuttals from each, then a 20 minute open discussion. There'll be four minute closing statements. And then after that, there will be a 15 minute Q&A. And that will be the place during this dialogue where we are going to be taking audience questions. So today, because he is the affirmative, Kent has agreed to go first. So I have my stopwatch ready to go. And Kent, you now have eight minutes. Please proceed. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science and math teacher in Christian schools for 15 years, moved to Pensacola in January of 89, and started a ministry called Creation Science Evangelism. I defend the position that the Bible is true. The evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. You have to believe that there's no God. You can't possibly know that, such, such a thing. So evolution is actually, and atheism actually, is actually a religion. Uh, it's not nothing scientific about evolution either. So with a topic today is the age of the earth. Is there evidence for a young earth? I think this is critical. First of all, I would point out that 6,000 years, which is what the Bible dates add up to, is not young. 6,000 is a long time. It's hard to visualize Abe Lincoln 170 years ago or Columbus 500 years ago. 6,000 is a really long time. Now, 4.5 billion won't fit in the human brain. If, if 6,000 years was a nickel, the thickness of a nickel, 4.5 billion is about 60 inches long, five feet in, on the chart. So it's five feet compared to the thickness of a nickel. I'm convinced everything can be explained with a, a, a rapid creation, six-day creation like the Bible teaches, 
which is essential for all the symbiotic relationships. There are so many plants that require certain animals to pollinate them, and for, the plants and animals reciprocate the gases. They have to be made within a few days of each other, like the Bible says. And <clears throat> I want to thank Steve for coming, because it's very hard to find opponents. This is, as by my best, best reckoning, my 169th debate that I've done. I've been turned down over 7,000 times for people who refuse to debate and defend the theory. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm just looking to defend the position. I think the Bible is true, and you better get ready for your death and your destiny. Uh, destiny? You're going to be dead for a really long time. You might want to pack a lunch for that trip. So I'm here to help. I'll get both of you, uh, both you and Shannon, converted uh, before this is over with. <clears throat> That's the goal anyway. We're going to try. Um, I think everything we see in earth and geology uh, and on the physics of the earth and in biology can be explained with a creation and a flood. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says the scoffers in the last days would be ignorant of the creation and the flood. And that's the whole problem. So uh, Dr. Dino is our website. How old is the earth? Well, there's two ways to answer this question. There's a biblical answer and a scientific answer. If you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did it sink? When did the boat sink? Well, you'd have to look at the youngest dates on the coins, not the oldest ones. The, the youngest date would be the limiting factor. If there is one scientific proof for, that the Earth is not billions of years old, the case is closed. And I understand if the age of the Earth is, can be limited down to a few thousand years, the whole argument for evolution and atheism is over. There has to have been a God. I understand how important this is to the atheists and evolutionists. They fight tooth and nail over this issue of getting billions of years. I point out, getting billions of years won't help. If I told you a frog could turn to a prince, if you kiss it, you'd say that's a fairy tale. But somehow they say, well, if the frog turns into the prince, if you wait billions of years, now it becomes modern science. No, it's not. It's still a fairy tale. Time won't help the evolution theory. It actually hurts it because things degrade with the second law of thermodynamics. But with all that aside, even if there were billions of years, there is no evidence for evolution of any animal turning into any other kind of animal. So I'm going to try this today to show you what the Bible says and what science says about the age of the Earth. Now, if you find a fossil like dinosaur toe bone, you notice it does not have a date stamped on it. It does not have, it doesn't talk. You have to assign your date to that. And the evolutionist will say, this is 70 million years old. The Christian will say, no, this is one that drowned in the flood. The Bible starts off the very first verse and says, in the beginning, well, that would be the beginning. <clears throat> God created the heaven and the earth. So God, at least in the Bible, God is claiming that he did it. And John 1 in the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And all things were made by him. So in the book of John, it claims the word, whoever that is, made everything. And we see later in John 1, 14, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, obviously Jesus. So the Bible is clearly claiming that Jesus is God, and Jesus made everything in Colossians 1. By him, that's Jesus, were all things created. This is the Bible clear teaching that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus is claiming that was the beginning when he made them male and female. Mark 10, 6, from the beginning of the creation. Romans, the book of Romans tells us, by one man, death came into the world. Man brought death into the world. In the evolution theory, death brought man into the world. Billions of things had to die in order for man to get here. All the inferior, unfit species had to die off for the superior, new, modified genes to be uh, accepted and spread around the world. This... Of course, obviously, my video number five leads to the philosophy leads to Adolf Hitler. Well, let's eliminate the inferiors and speed up the, the, uh, the process of evolution. But the Bible is clear that man brought death into the world. Death and suffering is man's fault, not God's fault. In evolution theory, ev death is the hero. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that man, by man came death. And the Bible says Adam was the first man. It's clear. And Eve is the mother of all living. That's what it says. And it says in Genesis 5 that Adam was 130 when his son was born, and that boy was 105 when his son was born. And the, the, you, go, you graph out the dates, it's easy to do from Genesis 5, and you'll come to the conclusion that the Bible clearly teaches the earth was created about 4,000 B.C., which would be 6,000 years ago. <clears throat> I don't put an exact date on it and say 4,004 B.C., I don't know, but it certainly was not millions. Textbook says the earth is millions of years old. Somebody is clearly lying. Jesus said... <clears throat> the cre creation of Adam was the beginning. 
So I think you need to realize if you want to say the earth is billions of years old, which people are welcome to do, they're, they're calling Jesus a liar. That's what and they're calling, saying the Bible is not true. Uh, here we go, right here. If you claim the earth is billions of years old, like I'm sure both of you do, just make sure, be honest, and admit you say the Bible is wrong and Jesus is lying, or somebody recorded Jesus incorrectly. So I would rest my case on the biblical answer being the earth is about 6,000 years old. Now, when you look at the scientific answer, that becomes a different can of worms here. That is a very interesting field of study. I've been a science teacher 15 years. I love studying this stuff. There are many scientific ways to prove the earth cannot be billions of years old. Now, <clears throat> I'm not aware of any scientific ways that show One the number minute. 1,000. <clears throat> but I'm aware of quite a few scientific ways that limit it to less than 4.5 billion. And that's the current date they're giving, 4.54 billion. Next week, it'll be something more probably. It always goes up. They add more time, as if time will help. But the Bible, And I'm fully aware that this issue of time is the pacifier for the evolutionist. Because given enough time in their mind, anything can happen. And if you take away time, they're going to cry like a baby. I completely understand, and I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. You can't have billions of years. And I cover on my video number one, <clears throat> called The Age of the Earth, about 50 different scientific ways to show the Earth is not billions of years old. It cannot be billions of years old. The galaxies are spinning. The stars in the middle are going faster than the stars at the outside. Spiral galaxies indicate they cannot be billions of years old. And I'm out of time. But anyway, we'll go through quite a few, if you'd like, scientific ways to show the Earth. But the Bible clearly says 6,000. And if you want to call God a liar, that's your business. But I would recommend you think about that twice before you do that. Thank you so much. Well done for being on time, Kent. You are at eight minutes and 1.63 seconds. So <laughs> very good. All right. Are you ready, Steve? When you're yeah, ready? it's going to be way shorter than eight minutes. Because... <laughs> All right. Give me a moment to reset. Whenever you're ready, as soon as you start speaking, I'll start your clock for you. Yeah, Just so to... I'm mainly interested in the back and forth, but I guess I, I heard a whole bunch of uh, citing the Bible for claims here, but we don't really have any evidence presented yet for an earth only being 6,000 years old, other than citing, I guess, passages from the Bible. Um, I heard a, a lot of very strange claims. I don't know how many of these we're going to end up going through. The idea that atheism is a religion. I mean, atheism literally means without religion. I, I guess we can debate the semantics of whether not being religious also makes you religious. Um, the, we, there's the coin analogy on the boat, the idea that if you find um, new coins in a boat, that that somehow shows you, I, I guess, the age of the earth. All that tells you is when the boat sank. It doesn't tell you when the coins were created. I'm not entirely sure where we're going with that one. Um, if you find a fossil that doesn't have a date stamped in it, there's like a number of different ways that we can date. Yeah, I don't know. I'm more interested in the back and forth, I guess, so we can move on to that part. Um, basically, I'm going to be arguing that none of these are really evidence for creationism whatsoever. I don't think I heard a single argument in favor. It's more just kind of like nitpicking the scientific arguments because they're not either well understood or because they're being misrepresented in order to maintain the idea that the earth is only 6,000 years old. And I'm more than willing to admit that the Bible is wrong and Jesus is either lying or doesn't exist. All right. Well, you were at a minute and five seconds. So at this point, we're going to be moving on to five minute rebuttal. So Kent, do you have a five minute rebuttal prepared for Stephen's statements? Well, we can go off 30 different ways. If you'd like, atheism is certainly a religion. You'd have to believe there's no God. How could you possibly know such a thing unless you had all knowledge, unless you can be all places at one time, which I, I doubt that you can see. That would mean, you know, God could exist in some place or some time or some manner that you don't understand or don't see or can't know. But as far as the coins in the boat, that's the whole point. If, if, if it only takes one evidence of a young earth to prove the point, it's just like if someone has 50 bits of evidence that says he's guilty of a murder, you know, his shoes are found at the scene, his footprints are found at the scene, but he's got one bit of evidence that says, look, I wasn't even in that town. I was in Chicago. Case closed. He's not, he's not guilty. So it takes one proof of innocence to prove innocence, even though there might be 40 more things that somebody planted or who knows what, but you can look at the, evidences for a young earth and only any one of them would show that uh, the earth cannot be billions of years old for example i mentioned the galaxies we see stars blowing up occasionally called a nova or a supernova nobody's ever seen one form we don't see stars forming at all I, in my last count i think there were i forget how many th th less than 300 supernova rings have been found uh, there's only they've only seen two in our galaxy in the history of recorded history two supernovas i believe Humans have only a couple thousand years of history recording these events. Astronomers reckon there have been only three or four completely reliable observations of supernova in our galaxy. This is from Cora a couple months ago. How many supernova have they identified? We have approximately 50 years or so uh, of observations with 
uh, looking for supernovas. I point out this guy says uh, there have been more than 10,000, but only three or four completely reliable observations. So stars getting brighter is not necessarily proof of a um, uh, star exploding, or just a spot getting brighter. Uh, I would point out that even if there are thousands of supernovas, I, it doesn't matter. That is the opposite of evolution. Where are the stars forming? Nobody's even got a good theory how a star can form. How do you get dust to collect into a solid with Boyle's gas laws? And it just goes against all the physical laws. And there's certainly no observation for it. You can believe that. But the current estimate is there are 70 sextillion stars visible from Earth with the big telescopes. That's 11 trillion stars per person on the planet. And we never see one form. The Bible claims that God made all the stars. I can't prove that, but that's what I believe. Uh, Jupiter, i got two minutes left. Jupiter is cooling off. I don't think anybody argues about that. Why do I Googled this an hour ago. Why do Jupiter and Saturn give off more heat than they receive? The reason is still unknown, they said on uh, Cool Cosmos. Well, unlike the other giant gas planets, Uranus does not radiate more heat. Neptune does radiate about twice as much energy as it receives from the sun, indicating that it, like Jupiter and Saturn, has an internal heat source. Well, hold it. If three of the gas planets out further way out in space are giving off more heat than they take in, this is going to put a time limit. This is like a coin in the box that says, bingo, stop, wait a minute. This might mean they are less than 4.5 billion years old. You can't keep giving off heat forever. Pretty soon, you've given off all your heat. So Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter gives off twice as much heat as it receives from the sun. How can Jupiter still be cooling off? Jupiter's moon Ganymede has a very strong magnetic field, which would require some temperature. The magnetic fields are generated by liquid motion of a molten metal inside a body. Ganymede should have cooled off solid billions of years ago from the Denver Post. So these planets that are, that are still giving up, have a magnetic field or are still giving off heat, I think is an, an indication. Here's an article from uh, about Ganymede. You can just Google it. Ganymede, the surprisingly magnetic moon. So I can go through, we can take a look at the stars or the planets or the sun burning its fuel or the Earth. There's all kinds of scientific indicators. The Earth cannot be billions of years old. Saturn's rings are very neat and orderly, and yet they're spreading away from the planet and moving. Why haven't they disappeared? And why does Saturn still give off heat infrared energy? It still has temperature. Steve, I think, I know you're desperate to have the Earth be billions of years old to make your theory sound reasonable. It doesn't sound reasonable even with billions of years. But... <clears throat> You can't have billions of years. There are too many indicators. It's not. Saturn's rings are vanishing. They're disappearing. From, well, it can't be billions of years old then. The moon is going around the Earth, but the moon is getting further from the Earth. The moon is gradually leaving us a couple inches a year. Will the moon ever leave its orbit? Space answers. The moon is gradually spiraling away from the Earth. Well, then that means it used to be closer. Why is the moon leaving us? I think if you look at that, say, what well, the moon is leaving us, it used to be closer. That puts a time limit. Now, what is that limit we can argue about? But the moon is get, getting about 3.8 centimeters further away from the Earth every year. I think you got you got to answer all these to get the Earth to, to get your uh, argument for billions of years. Okay, Time. go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you, Kent. So, Stephen, you now have a five-minute rebuttal, and then we will go into the open discussion segment. When, I'll start as soon as you start speaking. Okay, sure. So I'm going to move through uh, the points that I heard and the points that I can respond to. Um, I'll state again, I didn't hear any evidence in favor of young Earth creation, just a whole bunch of random science questions. Um, so the first thing has to do with being an atheist or an agnostic, okay? The idea that because you're an atheist, you're making a statement that there is no God, that is not true. What atheist means is you don't necessarily believe in the existence of a God. That's it. Gnosticism is a statement on whether or not you believe you can have knowledge about a God, and in that regard, I'm an agnostic. I don't believe you can have information about this. So my full thing would be an agnostic atheist. I don't currently have a belief in God but I also don't know if you can know about the existence of gods. Firstly, the second point we brought up was this the, the coin in the boat thing. So I, I think the purpose of this argument is to show that if there is a rock on the planet that we can date at 6,000 years old, that must mean that the planet is only 6,000 years old. I'm having a really hard time following this. Um, it just doesn't stand to reason that we're not going to find newer things on Earth just because the Earth itself is old. This would be like saying your skin on your face is only a week old, therefore you're only a week old. Well, that doesn't make sense because we know that your skin replenishes itself the same way that rocks replenish themselves on the planet. We see tectonic movements, we see volcanoes, we see lava, we see all of this stuff happening all the time. It's obvious that the Earth is constantly recycling the materials on its surface. This is something that's observed. It's not even up for debate. Um, 
the idea that we never see stars form. Um, I know that the Hubble is not capable of seeing stars outside of our galaxy, but I know that we do observe the formations of stars inside the Orion Nebula. That's something that we constantly observe. You can Google that and you can read all about the different types of stars and even planets that we think we are seeing form there. Now, it's really hard to see this stuff because we exist in the blink of an eye on like the entire like uh, universal time scale, right? Scientists say, what is it, like 13.8 billion years is the age of the universe, and we've been observing the stars for, with you know, with reliable instrumentation for 100, maybe. Um, so the idea that we can just watch a star fully form, you know, in 25 seconds, is, that's not going to happen. Um, I don't know what the exact time scale is, but it wouldn't surprise me if we could never watch the entire formation of a star in thousands of years, because these are probably processes that take, you know, millennium, at least, you know. Um, for the idea of why planets give off more heat than they take in, um, again, this doesn't prove young Earth creation, but I, if I had to guess, it's probably because um, when planets are formed at the beginning of any type of galaxy or any type of star system, I should say, um, the inside of a planet tends to be hot, right? They have active cores. This is where our magnetic fields come from. Um, so, for instance, the Earth has a magnetic field. Um, Jupiter has a magnetic field. Jupiter... Um, is another one of those planets that was formed, has a very hot interior, and probably gives off more heat as a result of that. That doesn't mean they're going to do it forever. Um, it doesn't mean they've been doing it forever, and it doesn't mean they have to only be 6,000 years old because they give off more heat um, than they take in. At some point, that process will probably stop. For instance, Mars's core is a dead core. Mars has no core um, that is active anymore. Mars also has no uh, electromagnetic uh, field as a result of that. Um, and then the final thing for the moon is gradually leaving us a couple inches a year. A lot of these assumptions about how things are working now and then trying to date them back by billions of years and saying, oh, well, look, you know, if you go back, you know, some billions of years, the, the moon should have been on the planet of the Earth. It just isn't true because you're assuming that the moon is leaving the Earth in a linear fashion, right? Scientists have measured um, the different ways that the tides have impacted the coast and whatnot, and they've seen that the, uh, the moon probably wasn't moving away from the Earth as fast as it is now. Um, this is just something that's observed that you could read about. You can very quickly read, like, how fast was the Earth moving away from the, or how fast was the moon moving away from the earth, you know, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million years ago. And to assume that it's been a linear um, thing where it's always been moving away at the exact same speed just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense with angular momentum if you consider the fact that when things get farther away, gravity impacts them different. And it doesn't make sense with what we've like recorded in terms of our scientific observation. Um, okay, that's what I got for that. All right, so you're at three minutes and 30 seconds. So now we're going to move on to the open dialogue portion. Mm -hmm. There's 20 minutes set for it. Destiny seated a significant amount of his time. So if the dialogue is going okay, I'm going to allow five minutes on the back end, if that's agreeable to both of you, so that we'll still be fulfilling the full amount of time that the audience is committed to to watch the debate. Is that agreeable to both of you? Yeah, that sure. is. Okay, okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that everybody ha is, is, is getting exactly the amount of time that, that they, uh, they wanted to see. So... I will uh, allow Kent to open the dialogue since he went first. Mm -hmm. And please just carry on in a back and forth fashion. If I feel that things are flying off the wheels, I will intercede. If I do that, I will stop the clock so that I can make sure that I am giving you your full time. So please proceed. Okay, uh, Steve, you mentioned you did not hear any evidence for a young Earth. And yet uh, the Bible certainly clearly teaches the earth is 6,000 years old. You di you're saying you discount that completely. That's not evidence at all. Is that your thinking? Um, no. So the Bible, yeah, no, I wouldn't consider the Bible to be evidence of that at all. Or okay. at least it doesn't present any evidence inside the Bible other than saying God said. Well, yeah, the, the Bible dates clearly add up to 6,000, uh, roughly plus or minus maybe 50 years. Um, and you mentioned about the skin on your face being renewed and how it, finding a rock 6,000 years. I didn't mention a rock. These things I'm talking about aren't even on the Earth. We could talk about the Earth if you'd like. The moon is going around the Earth. I don't think anybody, well, the flat earthers argue about that, but uh, they're wrong, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> but the moon is receding, and the, the tides seem to be affecting it. Uh, there's several different kinds of tides on the Earth. There's the, the water tide, of course, washing up on the beach, slowing the Earth down. There's also the winds, the Coriolis effect against the mountains, slowing the earth down. There's also the internal friction with the liquid inside the earth, which would be uh, having friction against the crust of the earth, differential speeds there. But see, there's the inverse square law is where you uh, need to consider something here. The inverse square law says if you br brought a planet or say two th things that attract each other, like the earth and the moon, if you bring it into one third the distance, you have to inverse that and square it. It's nine times the gravitational pull. So the problem is actually much worse for those who need billions of years. The fact that the moon today is moving away at 3.8 centimeters per year means in the past it was moving away faster. And if you go back billions of years, they've done all kinds of studies on this and said the moon's orbit would collapse into the Earth about 1.2 billion years ago. There's an article from uh, Astro Astro Astronomical Journal, oh, let me get up on screen here, <clears throat> back in 94. They said 
The evolution of the lunar semi-major axis presents a well-known time scale problem. The lunar orbit collapses only a little over a billion years ago. So if, if the moon leaving us does limit the Earth, uh, the age of the Earth to 1 billion years or 1.2 billion years, if this could be demonstrated scientifically and mathematically, would you still be able to fit your theory? I, I almost called it a religion because evolution is a religion. But would you be able to fit your theory into 1.2 billion years? Just based on the moon, I think we can limit, instead of 4.6, we can cut it down to 1.2. And that's just the moon. <clears throat> so I think uh, you, don't, you can't have 4.5 billion years to make your frog turn into a prince. I'm sorry. It's not available. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to the inverse square law. Um, in, in terms of, I, I've never heard this brought up as a reason for why the, the moon is receding at a different rate. Um, <clears throat> what, do, what? Well, let me explain. Have, I have, have, well, well, I, no, I, I, well, I understand. I don't, I don't, um, do you have any like evidence like in favor of young earth creation that's outside of the Bible or is it only going to be like, kind of like trying to poke at how, um, the, the current account might not necessarily be 100% correct. Well, the Astronomical Journal, Volume 108, is not part of the Bible. These are astronomers that put out a journal to say, hey, we got a problem. The moon is moving away. If you had two magnets that are attracted to each other, the further apart they get, the less the attraction is. It happens with gravity. It happens with light. The inverse square law for high school physics, which I taught for 15 years. So <clears throat> bringing the moon back in closer, 3.8 centimeters per year, as you go, if you could wind the clock backwards, the moon gets closer and closer, and then the attraction gets stronger and stronger, and pretty soon it snaps them together like two magnets. So the problem is greater than you realize. Well, but wouldn't and this depend on the velocity of the moon? If the moon, if the moon is traveling at a certain speed, though, the moon wouldn't fall to the Earth, no? The moon is traveling away from us, indicating it used to be closer. Well, but the moon, if you bring it closer, the, moon the is, attraction is even stronger yeah, because of the inverse square law. Sure, but the moon is traveling around the Earth. So just because it's close to the Earth doesn't necessarily mean it would fall into the planet, right? If the moon is moving at a certain speed and its orbit around the Earth, just bringing it closer wouldn't snap it to the planet. Well, bringing the moon in closer, if you could somehow get two magnets that are attracted to each other and get one swinging around like a, uh, a sling, if you could swing a magnet around and hold it with a magnetic pull, the invisible string to hold that magnet out there, bringing the magnet in closer, the attraction gets stronger by inverse square. You take half the distance, you would take one half, flip it over and square it. It's four times the pull at half the distance. At one third the distance, it's nine times the pull. And the astronomers are saying, look, about a billion years ago, the orbit will collapse. You cannot keep these two things apart. The gravity becomes too strong. Okay, so I don't, I don't, I don't think that astronomers are saying that the moon would have crashed into the Earth, but other things have changed in the Earth as well. Like, I don't think it's just as simple as saying the inverse square law. So, for instance, um, because of the way angular momentum works, the rotation of the planet of the Earth is going to impact the moon's orbit around the Earth as well. And we know that the Earth's orbit, for instance, for maybe for reasons you've listed earlier, has also slowed over time. So the fact that the Earth could have been spinning faster a long time ago, maybe it would have increased the velocity of the moon such that it could have been a little bit closer, but still traveling at such a speed that it wouldn't fall into the planet. I think that planetary mechanics are a little bit more complicated than just looking at the inverse square law well no yeah there is, is pretty complicated you are right and that's another factor that i think limits the earth it limits the universe or at least the earth's age down to less than billions is the earth is slowing down in its spin i think everybody agrees with that the earth is slowing down about a thousandth of a second every you know who knows how long every day they add a leap second i've got articles on that here let's see uh, the Earth is slowing down in its spin. I don't think anybody argues about that, and they think they know the reasons why. The Coriolis effect, the tides up on the beach, the internal friction, the lunar drag. The Earth slows down. Well, that indicates, A, it used to be going faster, which is, again, going to put some sort of time limit to limit. It's like taking the pacifier away, I know, but it's going to take away the billions of years because if the Earth were spinning faster, the crust would experience all kinds of problems flattening out like a Frisbee eventually if you get going fast enough just from the centrifugal force, the tides. Well, look at Jupiter. Jupiter spins around really fast and it has winds like 300 miles an hour. Hurricane, tornado force winds because of the spin of the, it's rapidly spinning. So you guys would like to imagine, like SpongeBob, imagine that life was here, you know, millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, and the earth is billions of years old. Just the spin of the earth, which is also affects the moon, those two things, the spin of the Earth and the distance to the moon, 
are going to limit it to less than billions of years. I don't understand. It's not a problem. Well, I don't understand why it has to limit it to billions of years. So if we say that the Earth slows down at about, it's like 0.005 seconds per year, that means that at the advent of our planet, when it was first forming, it would have had about a 14-hour day. I don't understand why that's an impossibility. Well, do you realize how many plants are photo, they have, re require a certain amount of daylight uh, hours and nighttime hours to work? You're going to have to have all the plants adjusting to the photoperiodism as the Earth changes. Well, I You're wouldn't say that plants uh, existed on the Earth 4.6 billion years ago. No, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. I'm just pointing out how that the, the spin of the Earth is another one of those limiting factors, like the coins in the box, that, that I didn't say when the ship was built or when the um, uh, coins were made. I said when the ship sank. If there are coins in a box in a sunken ship and you find the youngest coin, that limits it. The ship sank after that coin was made. And if we find one evidence that the Earth is not billions of years old, then it can't be billions of years old. Like the guy who says, look, you got all this evidence that I'm guilty of the crime, but I was in Chicago. He's off, he's off the hook. I don't, just like I, don't, that. I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that logically follows. But even so, we haven't presented any evidence that the Earth is only a certain you know, age. And even if we did, I don't understand how that would erase the idea that we have you know, um, zirconium that's, four point, that's measured at about 4.5 billion years of age. Like, I don't understand why if you find something young that necessarily eliminates the possibility of it being older. Well, if you find uh, a coin in the box that's older than the youngest one, it doesn't matter. How do you explain the moon is, the, the astronomy magazine said, less than a billion years? you got to answer that one. Wait, These are how, do you, how do you explain that the moon is a billion moon, years, or how do you explain you know, that the moon wouldn't have crashed into the Earth? Well, the astronomers who understand this say when you do all, run all the numbers, the moon, the lunar Earth, the lunar orbit around the moon, uh, Earth cannot be more than about a billion years old. You said, uh, you keep saying I haven't shown any evidence. I just showed you one. The moon says less than a billion. Why do you keep saying 4.5 billion for your theory? Be well, because that's- I showed you one without the Bible. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how to like get into a debate about orbital mechanics, but I know I know that scientists don't say that, that the moon is is a billion years old. I'm pretty sure that the most recent thing that I saw a couple of years ago was 4.5 billion was about the, the term that they came up with the uh, with the moon as well. Oh, 4.54 billion years old. And next week they'll add more time to it because they're finding more and more problems with turning your frog to a prince. I understand. But the, the moon says it can't be more than 1 billion. And so sure, you can find lots of people who say it's 4.5. That's what they're taught in school for heaven's sake. I bet you could find a lot of Muslims that think Allah was a prophet, and you could find a lot of Catholics that think the Pope is important, and you could find every religion supports their leaders and their people. That's standard, you know. Uh, uh, but the, if and if you find some scientists who say the Earth is billions of years old, that doesn't mean it is. That means they believe that it is. And if you can find some people who say they believe there's no God, that doesn't mean there's no God. That means they believe, with their very limited understanding, that there's no God. Okay, you believe what you want, but. The moon is indeed going around the Earth. The moon is indeed leaving. This is observable science. You run the mathematics on this and say, hold it, the moon is leaving 3.8 centimeters per year. Okay, let's run the math back. Oh, as you get closer, the gravity is stronger because of the inverse square law. They would indeed snap together or collapse like two magnets. You get them too close, they snap together. That would happen between the Earth and the moon about 1 billion years ago, according to the astronomers. So you've got to come up with a theory of evolution and a, a, a reason to reject God. You've got to come up with one in less than a billion years. And that's just one. You could look at the Earth's magnetic field. <clears throat> the magnetic field of the Earth is getting weaker. It puts a max time limit of about 25,000 years. Again, you go back to the inverse square law with the magnetic field. The magnetic field is getting weaker. If you go back in time, it was stronger. About 25,000 years ago, the scientists say, We've observed it for the last 150 years. It's declined 10%. It's declined 40% in the last 1,000 years. So the magnetic field, if you go back in time in your imaginary, rewind the clock back, the magnetic field is so strong that no life can be here. Here's National Geographic. Just uh, I want the date on this. I don't see it here. But Earth's magnetic field is fading. Here's one from last month. 
Well, let's, okay, mind. so just just to clear up the, the, the moon thing, or just to, I guess to put a wrap on this before we move on to another topic. So there was a study that was published in Science Advances where they dated um, pieces that were brought back from the Apollo missions for the moon. And their conclusion, which was consistent with a lot of other conclusions, was that the early formation of the moon was 4.51 billion years ago. And they demonstrate this not using, you know, physics math or whatever, but using uranium lead dating. So, I mean, this is, I don't think that there are astronomers that believe that the moon is only 400 million years old. I mean, like we've brought back a lot of evidence to look at this. I mean, I we could bring on like a physicist, I guess, to run through like the precise like orbital mechanics needed to explain the position of the moon, uh, you know, above the Earth. But I, I don't know if this goes against like the current scientific consensus in the field, or if or if either of us are like well read enough in physics to understand exactly how every single thing would play into what the what the path of the moon would have to be to explain how it could have been orbiting our planet for four and a half billion years. Well, would you agree the moon is leaving us? That's yes, it seems to be the case. Okay, would you agree that means it used to be closer? Yeah. If it's leaving us, it used to be closer. Stay with me now, okay? It used okay. to be closer. This is going to put a time limit, and I know you're frantic to not have a time limit, but there is a time limit, Steve. I'm sorry. And it's not 4.5 billion. They might have brought back a rock from the moon and dated it with potassium argon dating or uranium, uranium lead, uranium uh, 208, uh, lead 208, 206. It doesn't matter. The moon is leaving us. That puts a time limit of less than billions of years. All of the dating methods, whether it's carbon dating, potassium argon, uranium, doesn't matter. All the dating methods are based on some real obvious assumptions that a freshman law student could point out in court. Wait, what You're kind of assumptions? The decay rate has been constant through history. You can't possibly know that. You're assuming there's been no contamination. You're assuming you know well, what no, the initial on, wait, was. A lot of these aren't true. Firstly, decay rate is something that we can measure constantly. Now, you could argue that the decay rate might have changed sometime in the past, but all of science kind of rests on this fundamental assumption that the universe is, is pretty consistent in, in all points in time and in all points of the universe. Now, I mean, we could try to have that debate that maybe in some parts of the universe or at some points in time, physics has been different, but that's never been observed, and I would argue that no reasonable person believes that, yourself included, um, except for maybe, maybe in the very beginning when God was creating physics or whatever. So I I will be okay resting on the assumption that physics has always functioned the way that it does today. I think that's a fair assessment. Um, I agree. So, okay. I think physics has changed. I think that if we watch five, if we have a stadium full of people and we see five people leave every minute, can I determine when the crowd started? Maybe. Well, no, I but have maybe to not. assume how many were in the stadium. Have they always left at five per minute? Has there, there's too many assumptions. Well, sure, but th th that's what scientists do when they try to figure out, like, has the, for instance, has the moon always been leaving the planet at the exact same rate? And there are a lot of things that impact the speed at which the moon leaves the planet, right? The moon being closer to us might change the way that the tides move, which might make the moon move at a different rate away from us. And we can measure the um, the way that the tides have worked on the coast in the past to see if the moon has always moved away at the same speed, which it hasn't. Scientists say that the moon hasn't been moving away at the constant speed. You can't just take the current rate at which it's leaving us, subtract a billion years, and go, look, well, the moon would have been on the surface of the Earth. It's not that simple. And the idea that, well, like radiocarbon or potassium um, argon or, or all of these other dating methods or uranium lead are somehow circular or rest on some assumptions is just not true. These are observations that have made made time and time and time again. Multiple laboratories will confirm using different dating methods that there is accuracy using these types of like radio uh, dating methods. I don't understand how you can say that it all rests on these faulty assumptions that d just don't bear out in reality unless there's some global conspiracy theory to, to lie and forge scientific results everywhere. So I'm going to interject for just a moment and I have stopped the time. And the reason I'm going to interject is because we've been on this one specific topic for a great deal of time. Kent was allowed to open the direction of this dialogue. So I'm going to allow Destiny the opportunity, Stephen the opportunity to pose Kent a question as we are halfway through our time in order to to allow equal time for opening quest, open questions in the dialogue. Right. Yeah, I'm, I would be really interested in, in, in a single piece of evidence that points towards the idea of the Earth being 6,000 years old. Um, even in your attacks against the moon, you were still getting us to like hundreds of millions of years. I'm really curious what dates the planet at 6,000 years. Okay, well, I, I said at the beginning of my opening, I said the Bible clearly puts a date of about 6,000. And I said, I'm not aware of any scientific evidence that shows exactly 6,000, but I'm aware of many bits of scientific evidence that say it can't be 4.5 billion. So, okay, That's so we've gotten rid of 4.5 billion. I, there's a lot of other dates that we could choose, but okay, I, I need like one time. Well, no, no. Well, I'm curious if there's a piece of evidence that can get us to 6,000 that isn't just, you know, it was written in a, in a non-peer-reviewed book, like, like the Bible, right? Well. Let's look at the oldest historical records we have on the planet. Written history by man is less than 6,000 years old. The oldest example of capital punishment is 3,800 years ago. The oldest record. 
Now, one argument is, well, man was stupid in the past and didn't know how to write, and therefore they didn't have it. Or the other argument is, maybe that's when it started. So I've got a whole section in my PowerPoint, video one on Dr. Dino, the age of the Earth, talking about evidence from space, like the moon receding, the planets cooling off, uh, the Earth's magnetic field weakening, evidence from Earth, the ge geological evidence that it can't be billions of years old, and evidence from human civilization. I mean, for we, example, we even just for cave paintings, we know that's not true. I'm pretty sure we found those at you know past almost forty thousand years that that go back. So I, I mean, even on that end, you wouldn't be correct. What do you What do you mean? Well, uh, how how would you know a cave painting is forty thousand years old? Um, they can probably date it either using, I don't remember, 40,000 is old enough for carbon dating, but if not, they could probably use the, um, the name for the geological spectrum. There's a name for the, for the rocks um, that they find it in. But that goes know. back to the geologic column, right? Sure, okay. Yeah. Well, I think if you look at um, the, the oldest historical written records are less than about four or 5,000 years old. I'll call up my slides on that. But I could, we could really belabor the point, if you'd like, on the Earth's magnetic field or, the, or carbon dating. You, you seem to trust carbon dating. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll challenge you. Mm -hmm. Get a sample of a piece of coal, for instance, which has certainly carbon in it. Mm -hmm. Break it up into pieces and send it to five different laboratories. Do not tell any of the laboratories you've sent it to uh, someplace else. Do five independent studies on that one piece of coal. Mm -hmm. Break the coal up, five pieces, send it to five labs, and ask them the simple question, how old is it? I'd be willing to bet you a steak dinner, you'll get five different answers, and there'll be wildly different answers. So it really depends on... Mount St. So, so, Helens. Wait, okay. So okay. coal and diamonds, right, have different, depending on where they're found, there are different elements that can decay into the carbon-14 that we use for radiocarbon dating, right, which can lead to a form of contamination of the sample, which could give you an incorrect date. That's fine. <coughs> um, but this is something that is being currently investigated in the scientific community. It's not like this is totally unheard of. Like, people know that this is an issue, and people look into it when it comes to dating. But this sure. has nothing to do with the type of um, radiocarbon dating that we use to date, like, life forms, unless life forms i guess are eating coal then this wouldn't really be relevant when it comes to dating stuff well like yeah life forms are making coal as plants that make coal but you're admitting then that carbon, the decay right. rate the decay rate may be uh there may, there may have been some contamination mm -hmm. or the decay rate may have changed they've discovered some of the uh, elements that give huge numbers like potassium decays to argon and what at 1.5 billion years half of it that can be changed down to a few seconds with heat and pressure heat and pressure can change the decay rate rapidly so you're assuming that they find a fossil and date it today, and that somehow there's been no contamination. We know the decay rates remain constant. There's been no exposure to heat or pressure. There's been, uh, and you know the initial content for heaven's sake. Take my challenge, Steve. Get a piece of coke. Get get a fossil of an animal they dig up. Hey, what? Dig up the cat in the backyard you buried years ago if you have one. Send it to five different labs, pieces of it, and say how old is it? No other explanation. You will get five different answers. I guarantee it. Steak dinner. I, I mean, so possibly for coal, because of the way that coal works, that's true. But for biological life forms, um, that's not true. Like these have been dated using several different methods and most independent analyses will agree on like a pretty narrow range that something can be dated by. And tons of different laboratories using different methodologies will all like converge on the same answers for when things are found. The fact that you can show that in, in some elements, um, there might be some types of contamination, which can even be accounted for, by the way, like in all of these, it's not like it's impossible to account for the contamination. So for instance, because of the pollution that we put into the atmosphere today, people say that radiocarbon dating might be more difficult to do, but that's still something that can be accounted for. Um, just because you can show like one or two exemptions um, to, to how we carbon date things doesn't mean you can throw out the entire idea of radiocarbon dating. Well, I, I, the last I heard, it's about $500 to get a sample carbon dated. Uh, most laboratories charge about $500. They watch the, uh, check with the Geiger counter, how many uh, clicks do they get per minute on their Geiger counter as it, as it decays. Keep in mind, all dating methods, all of them are based on a decay. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's losing, not gaining. This is the opposite of evolution, by the way. It's going from a higher element to a lower element, potassium to argon, rubidium to strontium, et cetera. So <clears throat> they're all based on a decay. They're all based on clear assumptions. A freshman law student would say, Your Honor, you don't know how much was in that object when it started. They're, they're comparing everything to today. Like wait, wait, wait. Why do you think it matters how much was in there when it started? Well, today's atmosphere, you get about four, rough analogy, you get about 14 clicks per minute on your Geiger counter from a living object. Put it next to your cat or dog and you get about 14 clicks per minute. That's today's decay rate. 
Well, the Bible clearly teaches that before the earth, when the earth was first created, there was water above the firmament. Genesis chapter 1 talks about that. And so that would stop some of the radiation from the sun. And you would have, let's say, let's say the, everything before the flood only had two clicks per minute. That was normal in the atmosphere. There wasn't much radioactive carbon in the atmosphere. The animal dies in the flood, gets buried. We dig it up today, and we're comparing how old it is based on today's carbon uh, co concentration compared to what it lived under. They know there are all kinds of things that change. Watch my video on carbon dating. I'll send you one for free. Text me well, your I address. Mean, like, there's a ton of videos you can watch on carbon dating, but like all of these things are things that can be measured, right? So the atmosphere composition was different at one point in time. We can measure this based on fossil samples that we've taken from the ground, based on different dirts that we've taken from the ground. Like there are tons of different ways that we can measure what the planet was like at any particular point in time. And those things are generally accounted for in their measurements. This is why we have entire scientific disciplines that feel like they can accurately date things. And it's why in a multidisciplinary way, people tend to agree on the data of things like with, with very rare exception yeah they might like go over you know exactly how how old things were or they might have like new ways to refine their different types of dating techniques but this idea that because the planet was different at one point in time it's impossible to use any sort of dating method is just not true it's just not how any of it works okay i'll tell you what About three minutes just to let you both know mm -hmm. maybe you're not aware but if you send a sample of anything to be dated by any method potassium argon rubidium strontium lead 208 send it to any laboratory They'll, you'll have to fill out a questionnaire. One of the questions is, where did you find it? Now, hold on. Why should that matter? Why should I'll it matter where you find a sample? They're going to bracket with the date they're looking for based upon the geologic assumption that if you found it in this rock, it should be Jurassic and should be 65 million years old. So they want you to tell them where you found it so they because they may test it four or five times and get four or five different numbers, and they select the one that's closest to the geologic date. Watch my video number four, Lies in the Textbooks, about the history of the geologic column, which does not exist any place on the planet. There is no geologic column. The whole thing's a joke. All of it, all those layers happened during Noah's flood. Okay, firstly, One well, okay, so... Layers. Okay, so this sounds like a lose-lose, because if they didn't account for where it came from, then your argument right here would be, oh, well, how is it that they were able to account for any sort of error or any sort of contamination when they didn't even ask you where it came from? It sounds to me if they're asking where the sample originated from, they're doing their due diligence as scientists to try to control for any sort of contamination that could have occurred when they were measuring right. the sample. <clears throat> well, think carefully what you're saying. They're not actually dating it then with radiometric dating, they're dating with geologic dating. Because they're going to select the one they want anyway. You might as well not no, even no, send no, no, it to no. them. You're, you're, still, you're still using radiometric dating, but you need to be aware of any contaminations that could contaminate any of your samples while you're doing and how the would, dating. how would you be aware of that? How would you find out, oh, this has been contaminated by the geologic date? <clears throat> Because, there are, because there, are certain, there are certain geographic locations on Earth and there are certain periods in the Earth's history where they would understand that there is a higher presence of a certain type of radioactive isotope either in the atmosphere or in the dirt, and those would be things that would be accounted for when they go to do their measurements. This is it's like pretty well you really, you really believe what you just said? More than... The Bible go says it, yeah. It. Uh, <laughs> go back and listen to it again. Well, yeah, so like, I'm, I'm going to believe what's in peer-reviewed journals that have, that have been corroborated by scientists all over the planet rather than believe that there's some global okay. scientific conspiracy. Peer-reviewed peer -review journal, Astronomy Magazine, said the moon and Earth orbit problem limits it to 1 billion years. Fit your theory in 1 billion, not 4.5. Okay, Just even that. if I do that, that's still 999,994,000 years away from the 6,000-year-old Earth that you're positing right here. Like, I'm just pointing out that's one coin in the box that says, this guy's innocent, Your Honor. Let him off the hook. This Earth is not billions of years old. Well, not really. I could argue that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and the moon was spun off it a billion years ago. I mean, I could just as easily argue that. I don't think the evidence well, points to that. I think but... what's called that's called the ejection theory has been proven wrong years ago. The mechanics of that do not work. There, nobody. There's, the, there's a capture theory, the ejection theory, the collision theory about the moon. It, none of them work. The moon is nearly perfectly round, 2,160 mile diameter, and it's Earth that bulges 20 miles at the equator. But the Earth, moon's not spinning fast enough to have much bulge at all. The moon is near perfectly round. The moon was not spun off the Earth. The moon was not captured. The physics of that is impossible sure. to so capture the, the moon the most, going around. The most recent scientific evidence that I've seen published was that that 4.51 billion years on the on the moon. That's the current. I don't know why you keep citing the astronomy. I don't. I don't know what um, study you're citing or what what article you're citing. Or if it's even from a peer reviewed. Um, oh, I showed it on study. screen. Oh. I showed it on screen. It's a well known problem. It's called the lunar recession problem. Google it. Lots of people say, you know, this really does create a problem, and they sweep it under the rug. Say, look. We really need billions of years, so let's forget this one. Can't be true.
All right. I'm going to stop you guys there as there's a natural lull because we are at time. So now you okay. will each have an opportunity to have your four minute closing statements. And Kent, as you started, you will be the person who is going first and I will start <laughs> your time for you as soon as you start speaking. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Steve. It's very uh, honored you would come. I think the clearly the Bible indicates the earth is about 6,000 years old. God claims he made the world. I think that's intuitive. There must be a designer, a creator. This place is just too complicated. If you're walking through the woods and you find an arrowhead in a pile of gravel, you immediately conclude somebody made this. This isn't normal gravel. This has been shaped and fashioned. I don't know who did it. I don't know when did it, when he did it, but I know somebody did it. Now, when you look at the creation, whether you look through a microscope or a telescope or just your eyeballs, you ought to be able to say, wow, somebody designed this. When you look at a chlorophyll molecule in a plant, one chlorophyll is more complicated than the space shuttle, the most complex machine ever built by man. Every atom, every DNA molecule is mind-bogglingly complex. It's just common sense to say somebody had to design this. Now, who was it? Was it Allah or Buddha or Jehovah? That becomes a different set of arguments. But you seem not unable to get over the first hurdle. There had to be a designer. Now, we're arguing about when was it made? That's the second argument. Did somebody make it? Did somebody make this arrowhead? Obviously. When? I don't know. Now we can study the shapes and sizes and stuff like that. And why? Well, probably for, you know, some kind of weapon. But is there a designer period? I think the answer is a real clear, obvious, yes, there's a designer. How you can look through a telescope or a microscope and Darwin thought a cell was just a little glob of jelly. Now we have microscopes that understand that a single cell in your body, you've got about 100 trillion of them, replacing a millions, of, uh, millions of them every, every minute. But one cell in your body is more complex than New York City. One cell. And you really think that happened by chance with no designer from an explosion 4.51 billion years ago. I'm sorry, Steve, you've been duped, you've been lied to. You need to get your money back for education. They lied to you. This has been the history of the world, though. People have taught things that are crazy. Later, they find out, wow, that was crazy. Why do we believe that? And I'm telling you, it's crazy to believe in evolution. It's crazy to believe there's no designer. Now, we could get into another argument of who is the designer. Is it the God of the Bible or is you know a God? But I think a God, somebody way beyond our physics, made this. For God to make the world, he has to be outside of time, space, and matter. In Genesis 1, it says he created time, space, and matter. In the beginning, there's time, God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, matter. And they have to come into existence in that order. If you had matter before space, where would you put it? If you had matter and space before time, when would you put it? Ten words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you can, over, if you can overcome your hurdle and believe that, the rest is easy. God made the world. It's his obligation to tell us what he want, what's he want out of us, where his... Some people don't want God's rules on their life, and so that's why they deny God. There's no reason to be an atheist because of science. Now, you may have a moral reason to not be an atheist or a, a, some, some, something in your life you don't want God to change. I don't know. But there's no scientific reason to reject the God of the Bible and to reject the clear teaching that the earth is about 6,000 years old. That fits, I think, all the scientific evidence that we see. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. So, Kent, you were just under time, actually, three minutes and 14 seconds. All right, Steve, it is your turn. And as soon as you start speaking, I will start your four minutes of time. Um, sure. Um, okay. So, I mean, uh, we talked about the moon for like an hour here. Um, I, I was able to find, I guess it was a single page uh, or paper published in 1994. Um, there have been plenty of explanations given for the contrary for why the moon, you know, orbits at the speed that it does and the speed that the moon orbited back then. Um, I mean, I guess I can read this passage real quick if we care that much about the moon. According to Kepler's laws, the lower the distance between Earth and moon, the less time it takes for the moon to orbit the Earth. This means that the moon orbited much faster in ancient times if it was closer to Earth. Therefore, the frequency of the tides was lower because the difference of orbit time and the time of rotation of the Earth was lower, even if rotation was faster because the relative time change of Earth rotation is less than relative orbit, blah, 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 blah. Um, I, I mean, like, there, there's been a ton of studies that have, that have studied the age of the Earth and the age of the Moon. None of them have agreed on this one billion figure. I, I don't know where this came from, I guess, from this 1994 paper, but over the past 25 years, astronomers seem pretty confident to, to assert that the age of the Moon is about similar to the age of the Earth. Um, I mean, everything else was just kind of, I mean, I'm a little disappointed, I guess. It was just like non sequiturs. Um, the idea that a cell is more complicated than New York City doesn't necessarily imply design. Um, it, it doesn't even imply that it was designed. I mean, like complicated things can arise from uh, other things from entirely natural processes. Um, nobody's ever seen God create a human. Plenty of people have seen animals create other animals or people create other people. It happens all the time, right, through childbirth. We don't need a God for any of that process. I don't know why we would think we would have ever needed one. Um, 
I, I do agree one thing with the statement that you made that in the past we've taught things that are absolutely crazy and later on we change what we teach. I would argue that the difference between scientific instruction and religious instruction is that religious instruction has not changed at all over the past however many years your religious your particular religious ideology is old. Um, I, I mean Catholics and Christians and Jewish people and Muslims have been teaching the same things for more or less since the inception of their religion. Scientific stuff has changed in how we've taught it over the years as we gather more evidence and we change our beliefs and we update our beliefs to match the evidence that we've gathered. So I would argue that continuing to move in that direction and following what the scientific literature tells us is probably going to lead us to a better understanding of the universe than a very old book written a long time ago that hasn't changed any of its sentences in 2,000 years. Okay, so you were just at two minutes. So now we are going to move on to the Q&A segment, the audience Q&A segment. So James has sent me some of the questions. So I will start. Super Chats will get precedence because you guys have been kind enough to support the channel and thank you. All right, so I will start with Rob Plutonium at $10. What was Kent's PhD thesis about and where can I find it? Okay, uh, let's see. Shannon, your, one of your jobs as moderators, I understand is to keep this on topic. Is that on topic? Does that have anything to do with the age of the earth? I this is a kindergarten dropout. I don't see how that matters. I think it's it's if you guys, uh, if the debaters would prefer that it be on the debate content, uh, we're okay with that. That's what we've done in the past. So uh, we hadn't asked you yet. So if you'd prefer that, we can limit it to those. Um, I can do so, but generally we read Kent. Just to be clear, since since you've critiqued my ability to moderate here, no. as these have been done in the past, <laughs> I think I've I think I've been quite fair. But I, I I really feel as though that that the people these people have paid to ask questions because we didn't set that precedent for them from the get go. Sure. So um, that uh, I was attempting to be fair to the people who have paid to ask questions, and I did actually skip one that I felt was derisive uh, okay. for, for that very reason. So I just I just want to make it clear between you and I that right. I wasn't attempting to derail the topic of the specific debate, but this is the way that these Q&As are general. Sure. Are. So we I'm, can go to the next yeah, one. I, if, I, if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. But I just, moment of point of order to defend myself there briefly. <laughs> yeah, she, she did skip one that was questionable. I actually thought this one was less relevant than the first one. It's a gray area. We're sorry about that. Uh, let's see. But yeah, we can, uh, and uh, I think it's Rob. Rob, we can uh, send you the, the, the super chat money back if you'd like. That's not a problem. I know we didn't specify that so uh, for the audience, and we can we can uh, be in touch with you. So uh, Flamio asked, uh, he sent a super chat. Let's see. Uh, does, to Hovind, does the second law of thermodynamics apply to Yahweh? If so, how is it not degraded out of existence? If not, why are creations affected? Does the second law of thermodynamics, which means everything is tending toward disorder, does that apply to God? I'm not sure who Yahweh is, but does the God of the Bible? No, apparently it does not. God in the Bible at least claims that he is eternal. He's the everlasting one. He never tires or sleeps. He seems to be outside of and beyond all of our physical limitations. I don't understand that. I don't claim to. I don't need to. I, have to, I choose to believe that. That's why Christianity is a, is a faith. We admit we believe certain things. I believe God is eternal. He claims he's eternal. He claims that he wrote the book. And I've read the book for 50 years now and can't find any contradictions in it. And it's changed people's lives by the millions around the world without force. There are some churches claiming they believe the Bible that use force to get people their way. And apparently that's the school uh, Steve went to. But no, I don't, we don't use any force to change people's mind. But I think the, the change, life, my change life, in, 50 years ago when I was 16, I gave my heart to the Lord, got saved. I, I love science. I've taught science 15 years, and I love studying science, and I want to know. But I think there are certain things we just, we're probably never going to find out. Nobody to this day knows what gravity is. We know what it does. We can measure the speed of it, 9.8 meters per second or 32 feet per second per second. But we don't know what it is. Give me a jar of gravity and paint it red. Nobody knows what it is. All they do is define what it does. You don't have to know what it is. Well, it's, it's, we should keep studying. I'd like to find out. But meanwhile, I'm going to use it. I'm going to sit on the floor or chair rather than on the ceiling. So the fact that I don't understand all about God doesn't bother me. I've chosen to believe. If he's beyond and outside of my capabilities, if he is eternal and never gets tired, and the second law, the first law, none of the laws apply to him, whoa. 
Maybe when I get to heaven, I'll find out. And I'll try to relay the message to wherever you are at that time. All right. Thank you. Okay. So the next one I've skipped down to, to ones that were relevant. Uh, the next one is, can you please name an astronomer, astronomer, this is from Brian Stevens, who says that the moon is 1 billion years old. Is that for me again? Uh, it would be for either. If either of you have an astronomer that you can cite that says the moon is 1 billion years old, I'm sure that would be acceptable to Brian, who is the questioner. Okay. Jihad Tuma and Jack Wisdom wrote the article, Evolution of the Earth-Moon System in Astronomical Journal, back November 1994. Here's the reference to it. And they said, page 1954, they said, we got a problem. The lunar orbit collapses a billion years ago. Here are two astronomers that say, we got a problem. It's a billion, not 4.5. So you said, I named two instead of one. How's that? Okay, certainly. Gotcha. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, oh, James, Aaron, you're fine. I go forgot ahead. to mention that if we, I'd be, I'd love to like switch. So we go back and forth. I'll ask the question too. Please uh, do. Real quick on yeah. that, on that question about the astronomers. So apparently in that 1994 paper that was published, the two astronomers that did that paper didn't say that there was a problem. They offered an alternate explanation for why it could still be 4.5 billion years. Um, I can link uh, that paper in the chat for anybody to go through if they want to actually go through and read it. I don't have time to dig through. This is very heavy reading, but they they offer their explanation for um, re related to tides and whatnot for why, and then a ton of scientific uh, equations as well for for why the moon can be the age that it is. It doesn't say that it's a huge problem. Gotcha. Thanks for both of you. And then the Prince of Dreams. Let's see. Yes. Uh, We'll be in touch with you and refund you for that. Uh, he said, uh, Dr. Hoban, do you have to account for, or uh, doctor, do you, you have to, you have to account for where the moon originally formed? So I think that's for Kent. Okay, I would say based on the observed scientific evidence that the moon is leaving us, the moon must have been formed, uh, I don't pick a number, 20 or 30 or 40 miles closer. It has been receding for the last 6,000 years, and it's no big deal. If someone wants to believe it's billions of years old, they've got a problem, not me. We know the moon is receding. That's observable. We know some of the reasons why. Those are observable. The lunar uh, uh, tide you know, on the Earth, and we mentioned that, the Coriolis effect, the internal friction with the liquid magma core. So we know... If you go back and bring the moon closer, the tides are higher, which greatly exaggerates the problem, slowing the Earth down even more with higher tides, because back to the inverse square law. See, I don't have a problem with the fact that the moon is leaving. It fits perfectly in the creation theory that the whole thing's only 6,000 years old. I can see a car get the tires slowly wearing out. Okay, that means I could probably calculate approximately when they were bought brand new, if I knew has it always been driven the same number of miles per year over the same roads and same kind of driver's driving styles. But I, I, the moon is leaving us. That's even uh, Stephen agreed with that. So I don't understand how this is a, a problem. It, it is only a problem for those who would like to believe, capital B, believe that the earth is 4.5 billion years old. You cannot possibly know the earth is 4.5 billion years old. The oldest recorded history we have is just a few thousand years. So anything else is really taken on faith. You believe that the earth is billions of years old. That's not science. It's a religion. You'll never admit that, but it is a religion. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Shan, I think, forgive me, was it you had the next question? Yeah, I believe so. So this one is actually a statement and it's from Brian Stevens, but it is relevant. He said, destiny is correct. The mathematician T J Torna corrects the equations. I'm sure we could contact him today to see if he thinks the moon is 1 billion years old. So we had a follow up to that where he said, nowhere in the diff, uh, is it different equations, uh, differential equations, do they mention inverse square? Yeah, yeah so I think now, the, the orbital mechanics of like how the moon and the earth relate to one another <laughs> are probably a lot more complicated than just the inverse square law. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in a nonlinear fashion that changes over time that impacts the way that these two pretty massive gravitational bodies interact with one another. Well, now, hold on. The inverse square law is very simple. It applies to anything, two objects that are attracted. It applies to light. 
how many lumens are being put off by a light. As my dad was an electrical engineer. He designed buildings for caterpillar <clears> tractor. And yeah, but the, the inverse square law would be like very powerful if we were trying to describe two objects, two objects that were stationary maybe and how they impact one another. But as soon as we start with things that are orbiting one another and then we change one of those bodies like pretty dramatically throughout history. So for instance, the tides on the planet have changed. <laughs> the arrangement of the continents on the planet Earth have changed. Once you start making these sorts of changes and then you start rotating one of these bodies as well, things become a lot more complicated than just saying, inverse square law. I, I don't even know if the inverse square law has as much of an impact on this as any other of these forces, any, any well, related uh, angular momentum or anything else. Sorry, go ahead. Hold on, hold on. It's obvious I struck a nerve here. So mm -hmm. if the continents are moving on the planet, which they probably are, I don't argue that, that's going to make the problem worse because any movement on the earth is going to take away energy. If the continents are moving, if the tides are going up and down, being pulled up and down, and the, just it is very simple, light, magnetism, and uh, gravity are directly proportional to the inverse square law. You can Google it. It's simple freshman high school physics stuff that the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now, it's true, the physics on the planet, like the movement of the tides up and down and the movement of the continents, those would change the spin of the Earth, which may affect the, the rate of recession, but it doesn't affect the inverse square law any more than it affects the gravity. Yeah, but we don't know what's no, impacting the change. Gravity is still the same, 32 feet per second per second. But we're looking at the change of, of the moon moving away from the Earth. So according to a paper published in 1976, the magnitude of tidal friction depends on the arrangement of the continents. In the past, the continents were arranged such that tidal friction, and thus the rates of Earth's slowing and the moon's recessions, would have been less. The Earth's rotation has slowed at a rate of two seconds every 100,000 years. So it's possible that the arrangement of the continents themselves might have impacted the way that the oceans were, which would have impacted the way that the tidal forces impact the moon, right? Because tidal forces require an accumulation of large bodies of water, and arranging the continents in different manners might have changed the rate at which the moon moved away from the Earth. I mean, this is really heavy well, physics. It's not as easy as just saying inverse square law. Like, this is so much more complicated than that. What was the date on that paper? Um, this was a 1976 paper published okay. by Eicher. I don't know how to pronounce his name. E-I-C-H-E-R. Yeah. Well, okay. That's interesting. I love to study. If you've got some proof, I would go back to my initial statement an hour ago and say, even if the earth is billions of years old, that doesn't help anything for the evolution theory. That's just, this is just the first hurdle you guys have to overcome. Wait, well, you have to well billions of years this is only the theory reasonable. Yeah. Well, this is only talking about, um, I, <laughs> I mean, this is only talking about young earth, but for evolution, I mean, you've already made arguments in favor of evolution. I was under the impression that you believed in evolution. Well, it depends what you mean by evolution. I think you know, dogs and wolves may have a common ancestor. I don't think dogs and mosquitoes oh. have a common ancestor. Well, if you believe that dogs and wolves have a common ancestor, then you believe in evolution. We wouldn't disagree there. No, that's not evolution. That's a variation of the same kind of animal. Yeah, a, a variation in genetic traits right. passed from one animal to the next that causes measurable and observed differences between <clears> them. <throat> that's a type of evolution. So you believe in evolution. Well, the, the genetic traits that are passed on are, are mm -hmm. usually it's a loss of information. Do you have any examples where any animal has gained information that's been productive? I can show you examples of things losing, like the Chihuahua, completely useless dog. Somebody bred out of the dog gene pool. So you, that so you think that every single not survive in the wild? Wait, you think you think oh. that every single new dog um, that is, is bred has lost information from like a previous dog? I asked you, do you know of any examples where there's been a gain of information? <clears throat> I, I mean, mutations along genes can can produce new genes and new genetic combinations i don't, I don't understand what the question is well you're avoiding the question they can produce new genetic combinations can they produce new information what do you can, can you tell me what you mean by information well <clears throat> could a dog eventually grow wings and be able to fly he could catch his prey faster that way um the, over long periods of time theoretically sure I, it could happen yeah is that be something would that be a statement that you're saying that is scientific or that is religious or faith-based you believe it could happen. Has it been observed? Has anybody ever observed a dog produce a non-dog? No, but that's not <clears> consistent <throat> with how we believe evolution works. Well, that's my point. What we observe, which is what science is all about, observation, experimentation, testing, mm -hmm. all the testing, all the experiments, all the observation says dogs produce dogs, cows produce cows. If you want to believe it was different, if you go back in time, which we can't go back in time, mm -hmm. that's your belief. It's your religion. It's a, you have a religious belief that dogs and mosquitoes are related. If you go back billions of years, I don't know who taught you that, but you need to get your money back. Do you believe? Like do you, do you think that? Let's do you give think Destiny what, a quick chance to respond, and then I, forgive me. I just to try to get through as many questions as possible. Oh, we'll, sure. 
back. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, there's like a lot of weird like semantic uh, games that are being played here. Um, when you talk about like gaining information, um, I'm not entirely sure what definition of information you're talking about. I mean, there are uh, mutations that occur along genes that allow them to duplicate strands of DNA. That if that counts as adding information, then of course that counts as information. Um, that using using this word belief is kind of like is a pretty common tactic, I think, by a lot of religious people. Um, so like I, I believe in evolution the same way that you believe in God, but that's not really true. Um, I believe, for instance, that if I go downstairs, my car is still going to be parked in the garage. I don't 100% know that, but I'm basing that on prior observations I've made and because I have a model of the universe that seems to work for me, which is if I leave something somewhere, I believe that when I go back to it, I'll find it again. I don't think that all beliefs are equal, and I think it's really disingenuous to try to claim that all beliefs are equal. Just because I believe in something that has been affirmed time and time again by a scientific model that has also been affirmed by hundreds of other or thousands of other peer-reviewed scientists doesn't mean that it's the same type of belief as I believe there is a unicorn flying around the asteroid belt somewhere. Got it. Next, we appreciate uh, and uh, we appreciate your super chats. I'm trying to catch all these for Dave <laughs> Galifor, uh, just uh, because I'm trying to see if they're kind of coherent, if they like sure. fit with well, each other. I have a I have a quick question while you're compiling those to send over. So this question is specifically on the topic, and I think it was what I think that, and the reason I'm asking it is because I think it more succinctly gets to what Destiny was attempting to ask earlier. So my question would be for Kent, and it's a kind of a paraphrase of one of Destiny's earlier points. The question that I'm not sure was addressed by Destiny was without appealing specifically to the Bible or using a refutation to existing science, what is the single best piece of evidence that you have that the Earth is specifically 6,000 years old, which would not allow you to appeal to the moon because that at, at, at the least would put it at 1 billion. So do you have one specific piece of independent evidence without using the Bible or without just refuting existing science that you would say proves the Earth is 6,000 years old? Is this a question well, for the audience, Shan? No, no, that was, that was me paraphrasing one of his while you were compiling them. Uh, let's, if you're okay with it, just as moderators, if we can just let the audience ask, that would be... Well, that's uh, fine by me if you don't want the question asked. And uh, give me... Shannon, Shannon, you can do the next debate. Call my secretary to schedule. I'll take you on next. Okay? <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure. Why not? Please, please do. 855-BIG-DINO, extension 2. <laughs> Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to just get through as many questions as possible. I, I suppose since it's been asked, Kent, if you want to give a response, you can. Otherwise, um, I'm okay with just trying to squeeze in as many questions <clears throat> from the audience that we've got. Well, the largest desert in the world is the Sahara Desert. There's an area south of the Sahara called the Sahel, where cre creatures and people are dying like crazy because the Sahara Desert is expanding. This has been known for quite a while. Sahara Desert's about 1,300 miles north to south. It is expanding. The Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact in Germany back in 99 did an article and said the Sahara Desert is about 4,000 years old. Well, some people say oh, it might be 6,000 years old. Okay, the point is, it's not millions. So the Sahara Desert used to be green and lush, and then humans, should they're blaming it on humans, of course, in popular science. But I think everybody agrees the Sahara Desert is growing, and the Sahara Desert has, that puts a time limit for when it started. Now that, they will argue, doesn't argue for the age of the earth, and I understand, but it, why isn't there a desert that's bigger than that? Why 4,000 or 6,000? Why not millions? We see this grow. They're, they're going to have to say, well, there might, you don't know that the rate has been the same, which is exactly what I say about carbon dating. We have to, if you look at the observation of what we see, it's expanding. It is less than 4,000 years old or less than 6,000 years old. That fits perfectly with what the Bible teaches. The very best evidence for the Earth being 6,000 years old is the Bible. That's what it claims. It's never been refuted. I don't think you can prove anything above 6,000 years without some very obvious assumptions. So I could get in, in my video number one, I cover about 40 or 50 different ways to show this Earth is not billions of years old. The oil pressure, the human population growth rate, for heaven's sake. There's only 7.4 billion people on the planet, which could have come from eight people just four or 5,000 years ago at normal population growth. So I could give you many scientific evidences that indicate less than less than 10,000. And um, I, if we had another hour, I'd give them all to you. Just watch video number one on seminar one, the age of the earth on drdino.com. I, I don't know what the age of the Sahara Desert has to do with the age of the planet. 
like I, a, I, there are plenty of things on the planet that are less than like just because the the planet is 4.5 billion years old doesn't mean that like like that would be like going outside and i see like a tree or i see like a field of grass and i'm like well this field of grass is only 200 years old therefore like uh, that's a total non sequitur it's totally irrational well that's why i pointed out there are many indicators scientific and scriptural and lit and lit literary the oldest writings the oldest books the population of the earth the oil pressure down in the ground you drill down in you get pressure that's way above the weight of overbearing rock why is there still oil pressure it should have cracked the rock it's up to 20,000 psi because tectonic plates constantly recycle themselves this is part of the movement of the earth if you live on the west coast in california you felt these tectonic plates move we have earthquakes all the time i oh, mean yeah. islands are being i know i lived out there yeah so i mean this isn't that mysterious well it is just an indicator that all the oil pressure could have been formed from oil that was formed because of Noah's flood from people being buried 4,400 years ago, people and animals being buried. It fits perfectly with what the Bible says. That's not proof the Bible's true, but it's certainly not any proof against the Bible. I mean, if The you... fact that we have oil pressure above the weight of overbearing rock and the fact that the moon is leaving us and the fact that the Sahara Desert is less than 6,000 years old, these are all coins in the box that indicate, hey, maybe it's less than 6,000 years old. It certainly could be. There's no scientific reason to prove more than 6,000 years. What is the best evidence you would have for more than 6,000. Uh, well, so before we get into that, I mean, it, it feels like we're basically trying to collect like pieces of evidence that we feel like we, uh, that agree with us. Like, uh, so I go to your body and I snip off a piece of hair and I say, well, this hair can't possibly be more than five years old. Um, or I imagine you probably get your hair cut more often than that. This hair can't be older than a few months old. I take some fingernail clippings and I say, oh, well, these fingernails can't be more than, um, you know, maybe a, a week or two old if that, um, you know, I, I scrape off, you know, a whole bunch of cells and random spots of your body and I go, well, look how new these are. Well, look, 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 look. I mean, you can play that with the earth all day long. I mean, there's tons of things on this planet that are going to be newer features but there are also things that we've pretty accurately dated back like billions of years i don't understand the obsession with only finding and focusing on the new things and so that disproves the older stuff we found um it seems to harken back to that really irrational analogy that we use for finding coins on a boat where we keep saying oh well if we found a coin you know that was from 1960 and there are other coins you know from 1700 we know that the boat sank in 1960 but you're ignoring the fact that even in that analogy you're saying that the planet existed in the original year that the oldest coin was found like even that that even that very analogy taken to its logical end seems to disprove your entire argument <clears throat> well this is what i said at the very beginning in the opening uh moments of this uh, discussion or debate this issue of time is the pacifier for the evolutionist you have to have billions Wait, of why years. do we keep saying evolutionist we're, we're talking about the planet we're not talking about evolution right now that's a totally different thing uh, those those who want to believe that there is no god or they want to believe we got here by chance or they want to believe the earth is billions of years old to account for all the changes to turn a mosquito and a, to make a dog and a mosquito related, that's what this is really what, about. It, really, it's about rejection of God. They don't like the idea that God created everything, and and He designed it. And there's there, He might have some rules uh, like Thou shalt not. They don't like those rules. So I think there are many indicators that say the Earth cannot be billions of years old. I'll just show you since you asked for one that shows six thousand. I'll get my slides up here. Um, the population of the Earth today is about 7.4 billion and increasing as they're making more kids all the time. But if you look at the population at the time of Jesus Christ, the Earth's population was about one quarter of a billion. There were surveys done, you know, Pilate, Jesus was born in Bethlehem because of a census, you know, they had to count their people. So they've always been counting their people to see how much tax to charge and all this kind of stuff. But the population of the Earth, if I can get the right slides here, indicates at the, in the year 1800, just 200 years ago, the entire world's population was 1 billion. We've gone from 1 billion to uh, 7.4 billion just in 200 years. When you look at the, when you graph it out, look at the population growth, and I can't find the slide quickly here, but I do this on video number one. Um, the population growth indicates man's been here for less than 4,500 years. You can easily account for the population of the earth today in 4,500 years. So if man had been here for millions of years, why wouldn't there be more people? So this again, we're making this another of the many indications. Yeah, so we're making the same mistake that we did with the moon thing, where we keep assuming that population growth is linear. It's not. I mean, if we, you know, if you know anything about derivatives and we study a little bit about the rate of change, so not not how much is changing, but how quick is the rate of change itself changing, right? We can look at like, for instance, if you Google right now, we could Google birth rate United States, and we could bring up and we could see that oh, well, these countries have actually given birth to different amounts of people over different time periods. You know, if you see the population at 
at 1 million and next year it's 2 million, that doesn't mean the next year it's going to be 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, right? Population growth could slow. It could, you know, ebb and wane. I think that's a phrase, um, you know, based on different things going on on the planet. You know, there are giant plagues that make people sick. Different countries reach industrialized periods where they have less children. Um, you know, there's great migrations, great wars. There's a million different things that could cause the population of a planet to change. You would never look at a population growth and, and try to date the earth using that because population growth is more of an anthropological or sociological phenomenon than anything relating to geology or any of the scientific disciplines that study the age of the earth. These are two totally disconnected things. Um, also, this idea that, like, I don't like this theological argument that we're making uh, because there's no possible reason why you would have to subscribe to young earth creationism to believe that God um, demands a 6,000-year-old earth. That's just absolutely not true. Um, we could absolutely, for instance, believe that everything has been divinely created by God himself, but God didn't create man. God created the evolutionary process that spawned man. There's no reason not to believe that God could have very much set in motion at the beginning of the universe the clock that would eventually lead to the creation of mankind, maybe even lead to stories like Genesis. Um, we could also believe, for instance, that the earlier Bible was written in more of a metaphorical sense. That six days doesn't necessarily equate to six days of mankind's time, right? Six days in God's time could, could be lifetimes or universes worth of time, you know, for normal people. Um, I don't think that theology demands you turn your back on science. In fact, there are many scientists today that believe in evolution, that believe in the age of the earth, um, that believe in all of these scientific concepts that are also very religious. And yeah, the idea that God demands that you believe or subscribe to some 6,000-year-old earth, I think, betrays maybe even the power that you would profess that God himself has. Well, the topic of the debate was supposed to be, what is the evidence uh, for the young earth? And I pointed out, A, 6,000 is not young. There's plenty of time to account for everything. But uh, there's lots of evidence. It's not billions. Population growth chart. Uh, the United Nations uh, put the chart together. I've got, I've got use Google, what population of the earth in the past it shows rapid increase in the last 200 years. I agree, many things affect this. I agree, there can be plagues. But even taking that all into consideration, the United Nations population chart, let me call it up here, all right, uh, here. Population, pop, pop, population prospects from 2004. United Nations population prospects, 2004 revised edition. Um, this is the population, that this is, they, this is the observed population of the Earth at different times through history. Mm -hmm. It indicates man could have easily started from eight people getting off of Noah's Ark 4,500 years ago and created 7.4 billion people. It's not a problem for me. If you want to imagine a very tiny population of a few hundred thousand people going on for millions of years because nobody figured out how to make babies, you can imagine that if you'd like, but I think they would have figured it out pretty quickly. I, I mean, we, I, these, I, I'm not, I don't really know what to say. Um, these things have nothing to do with one another. It's, this is just a total non sequitur. Um, the population on the planet just has nothing to do with the age of the Earth. Um, so, for instance, right now, we believe that the population of this planet, the, the, the 13th billionth human, will probably never be born, right? People are extrapolating based on birth rates in Africa and South America that the population is probably going to taper off somewhere in the 12 billion range for people. So, let's say, for instance, we go 100 years into the future and we've had 12 billion people forever, you know, for hundreds of years. Would somebody like you look back and go, oh, well, look, I would argue that there's always been 12 billion people or that the earth is only 200 years old because our population hasn't changed at all since then. I, I'm, not, I'm not even trying to respond. Like, it's just a total non sequitur. Nobody would ever try to date anything geological using the existence of a biological organism. I mean, like, did the earth stop existing when the dinosaurs stopped existing? Or do we try to date or measure geological formations based on the population of certain animals in the sea or sky? It just doesn't make sense. It's a total non sequitur. Got a, Vivian, I know that you got a response, Kent. I'm sorry to do this to you, but we have to just to try to get some more questions as quick as we can. Oh, real quick, uh, can, can you give him, because you've given me the last word, I think the last two, you can give him the last word on that one, and then we can do the next one if, you, if you're okay with that. Okay, you bet. Go ahead, Kent. I know you got a, you got a round in the chamber ready to go, so go ahead, <laughs> give a response. I didn't follow. Is he saying he wants me to have the last word on that one? Yeah, yeah he's, because he's I've had the last word you. on the last two, so yeah. Sorry. Whoa. Well, I'm just pointing out that the, the Bible clearly teaches the, the eight people survived a global flood, of which there are now 330 surviving flood legends that have been found. We're having that at our uh, boot camp next month. Come on down to boot camp on drdino.com. But uh, uh, the uh, population of eight people getting off the ark, starting producing children, could easily produce what we currently have. Now, does that prove the earth is billions of years old? Oh, of course not. But it's an indication of one of many indicators like a, any detective at a crime scene would say, this clue needs to be put into the formula. Wow, the moon is moving away. The planets are cooling off. They're, they don't have no, no way to get heat other than the sun. How on earth can these, and gravitational collapse, 
how can these planets still be giving off heat for billions of years? How can the galaxies be spinning in different directions or you know, different speeds in the galaxy? So you put together all the evidence, and I think you come to the conclusion, it's much simpler to say, this is not billions of years old. It just can't be. And again, even with billions, that's not going to help the evolution theory. But you can't even have the billions. It's taken the pacifier away from the baby. I'm aware of that, but okay. But <laughs> okay. thank you for the last word. Go ahead. All right, Kent. So the next question that we have from the live chat, and we're, we're running low on time, uh, is from, it looks like A. Dine, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, and it is, does Kent believe in dinosaurs? Oh, that is my favorite topic. Our website is drdino.com. My phone number is 855-BIG-DINO. Yes, dinosaurs were just giant reptiles that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says before the flood came, the people lived to be 900. Well, reptiles and kangaroos and a few other animals never stopped growing. If an animal could live that never stops growing could live to be 900, they would get really, really big. So we're finding the skeletons of these dinosaurs all over the world, including Antarctica and the, near the North Pole in northern Alaska. They're finding these dinosaur skeletons because of Noah's flood. Dinosaurs always lived with man. They probably had a different name for them since the name dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. But all through history, they call them dragons or some name similar to that. They're mentioned in the Bible. They've always lived with man. There are thousands of examples of people killing dinosaurs or dragons by ancient artwork, ancient stories, uh, and lots of stuff. Watch my video number three about dinosaurs and the Bible. Yes, absolutely. There could even be some still alive. I've never seen one, but I've interviewed 100 people who claim they have. Seen like pterodactyls seem to still be alive in a few parts of the world. Uh, a patasaurus in the Congo swamp in Africa. Loch Ness Monster. We have 11,000 people claiming they've seen a plesiosaur. Some may be hoaxes or frauds, I'm sure. But if 11,000 people claim they've seen something, maybe they've seen something. So I think the evidence would be a better look at this. But see, because that goes against the evolution teaching that they've been gone for 70 million years, if they caught... <laughs> I make a prediction. <clears throat> if somebody caught the Loch Ness Monster and it turned out to be a plesiosaur, let's assume that happened, and they put it in the London Zoo, they would put a sign at the bottom and say, look at this, boys and girls, this one survived for 65 million years. The thought will never cross their brain that maybe my whole theory is stupid. And the whole theory is stupid. Dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. They lived with man. Could be if you're still alive. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. All right. So, James, did you want the next question? If not, I can move to the last one that you sent me. Uh, I've got, let's see, was it the ones from Dave Dallafor? Uh, I haven't seen those ones yet. This one was from Terry James. Just you got in regards to the last question, I would say that it's very peculiar that with the advent of cell phone technology, it seems like reportings of like the Loch Ness Monster and whatnot have significantly decreased. I think that's very interesting. But Or maybe it died. <laughs> That was <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite convenient. <laughs> I guess. Maybe all the dinosaurs died as soon as cell phone cameras were invented, but possible. Lord, Lord. Oh my gosh, sorry. All right, so this one is from Terry James, and it is Kent. Do you believe, and this is relevant because evolution was brought up multiple times, Kent, do you believe that a bulldog came from a non-bulldog? I think a bulldog is still in the dog kind. Now, we've decided to divide the dog family up into 339 recognized breeds of dogs. So, yes, the bulldog would have come from something other than bulldog, but bulldog is too fine of a division. It, it did not come from anything that was non-dog. But certainly, people develop new breeds and give it new names all the time. That's still the same kind. See, the Bible says 10 times in the first chapter and 10 times more in the flood story, 20 times in seven chapters, the Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. So no, the bulldog did not from, come from anything that was a different kind. Now, ask your person who asked that question, do they believe bulldogs and mosquitoes are related? If they believe in evolution, they'll have to say yes. Now, that would be a different kind. If an amoeba turned into a bulldog over billions, in, in, tr trillions of years, it has to gain new information. Where in the gene code of the amoeba is the information to build a skeleton or a or hair, or um, eyes, or ears, or um, this different systems in, in a human body. In order to go from an amoeba to a human, you have to add trillions of bits of information. There has never been observed. That's not science. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups, and it's sad that so many believe that, but that's why our ministry is here. We're here to help. We can get them all straightened out. Tell them to call me. I'll straighten them out, okay?
Okay. I, so anybody who knows me know how hard it, hard it is for me to not say things, but James, go ahead. Not, we as moderators <laughs> were fully nonpartisan. Uh, Dutch, did you have a response? Um, yeah, so uh, in case... I, I guess if people don't actually know, right? So the way that evolutionary, like the, the way that evolution works is for large changes to occur, it's usually like incremental changes over long periods of time. So for instance, an animal with no backbone won't suddenly have a backbone. You know, they don't develop like an entire spine overnight. What would happen most likely is there would be small incremental changes that might allow it to stand upright a little bit, or that might allow it to perk up a little bit that would pass on some sort of evolutionary advantage that would allow it to breed or outbreed things that don't possess that genetic trait. And then over a long, long, long periods of time we would expect to see these changes accrue in such a way that um that, that eventually you would have animals that are highly different different differentiated from one another um I, I mean like we have observed increased genetic variation in populations we've observed increase in genetic material um we've observed in uh, creation of new genetic material and we've seen newly genetically regulated abilities these have all been like published in the scientific literature it's not a mystery it's not like a it's not like something that has never been seen before it's a huge response in science that's been waited for uh, these are all things that are are pretty well understood and aren't really controversial to any scientist that actually spends time like researching or publishing stuff like this. Gotcha. Thanks so much, uh, both speakers. And uh, quick, I'm going to try to run through. I tried to let everybody know in the live chat, we can't take any more questions. We've got so many awesome questions and super chats and stuff. We, and so we can't even read any new super chats uh, just for the sake of time, because sometimes it's uh, basically we're already over time. The debaters have been uh, super patient. So want to just if i can squeeze these last ones in they're related uh and these were asked pretty early uh dave dalafor thanks for your super chats we appreciate it uh let's see one is yes how do we carbon date a freshly killed seal i think that's for uh kent i think that's on the critique that you gave on carbon dating <clears throat> well anything that contains carbon should be able to be carbon dated Anything that is alive or was alive, that would include plants or animals. Carbon-14 enters because of the sunlight striking nitrogen, creating carbon-14 in the atmosphere. About 21 pounds of carbon-14 is created every year worldwide. So the state of Alabama, right, there probably gets, you know, 50 molecules uh, over uh, per day. Not much. Plants are constantly breathing in this carbon dioxide, some of which is radioactive, a very small amount, 0.0000765% radioactive carbon is the current amount in the atmosphere. Now, has it always been that? Who knows? Well, they know many things cause this to fluctuate up and down. So when an animal dies, I'm sorry, when the plant dies, it stops taking in C14. When the animal eats it, the radioactive C14 gets into the animal. So in theory, living plants and animals should have the same amount of C14 in them that the atmosphere does right now. Okay, so when it's dead, you should be able to date a freshly killed seal or anything and find it would be zero years old. I challenge, again, Steve, or you or anybody else, get a sample. Let's go ahead and go to the vet and let's find some dog they euthanized and let's take cut it up into five pieces and send to five different laboratories with no other information other than ask them the question, how old is it? And they're going to try to get you to give a bunch of information so they can bracket it down based on what they want it to be, based on the evolution theory. But a completely blind test with five laboratories, state dinner on the line here for both of you, Chan and you too. They will get five different numbers, and they will not be the same, and they will not be close to zero because it, carbon dating doesn't work. None of the dating methods work. They're based on simple, obvious freshman law student assumptions. What was the amount in it when it died? Uh, has it always decayed at the same rate? Has there been any contamination? You admitted there could be fluctuations in the moon. You're frantically trying to answer the moon question, not realizing <clears throat> you're also answering the carbon dating question. It doesn't work. There are too many things that fluctuate back and forth. You can't use it to be reliable. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. So no one is, um, no one is like trying really hard to answer the moon question. I'm pretty sure that's just established. I, I think it's taken for granted now. Um, again, I pointed to the study two years ago um, where they pretty much narrowed in on that 4.51 billion year age for the moon uh, based on the dating that they'd done from pieces that were brought back in one of the Apollo missions. 
so related to the seal thing, um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to read a passage here. This is, a well, this is the well-known reservoir effect that occurs also with mollusks and other animals that live in the water. It happens when old carbon is introduced into the water. In the above case of the seal, old carbon dioxide is present within deep ocean bottom water that has been circulating through the ocean for thousands of years before upwelling along the Antarctic coast. The seals feed off of animals that live in nutrient-rich upwelling zones. The water that is upwelling has been traveling along the bottom for a few thousand years before surfacing. The carbon dioxide in it came from the atmosphere before the water sank. Thus, the carbon in the seawater is a couple thousand years old from when it was in the atmosphere, and its radiocarbon content reflects this time. Plants incorporate uh, this old carbon in them as they grow. Animals eat the plants, seals eat the animals, and the old carbon from the bottom waters is passed through the food chain. As a result, the radiocarbon content reflects a mixture of old radiocarbon, which is thousands of years old, and contemporary radiocarbon from the atmosphere. The result is an apparent age that differs from the true age of the seal. The reservoir effect is well known by scientists who work hard to understand the limitation of their tools. It is explained, for example, in two different, um, I can't pronounce this guy's name, but in a 1980 study by Fair Far and Higman, or in hy hyphen, I don't know what to pronounce his name, contrary to creationist propaganda, limitations of a tool do not invalidate the tool. So again, pointing out like an issue or an error or a possibility of contamination doesn't mean all of a sudden that we throw out the entire validity of using the tool, just because in some edge cases, that tool might not give us an accurate answer. Although in this <coughs> case, I would argue that it actually does give you an accurate answer. You're just not radiocarbon dating the animal itself, you're radiocarbon dating the water that has, or the oil that's been passed along the surface of the ocean that has been brought up via you know this chain of how things eat each other but again just because there are some issues with the tool doesn't mean you throw the entire tool out completely it just means that you refine your tool and you understand the limitations of said tool and then you continue to use it in areas where it's appropriate to thank you wow. Harry. you're obviously very excited about all this calm down for a minute i think if you're saying that you're admitting of course that there can be reservoirs of a different amount of carbon deep in the ocean that could be brought up by currents and the seal happened to drink the wrong kind of water therefore it got contaminated I think you're admitting my point, Stephen, that you cannot trust carbon dating. You cannot, because there are too many things that can influence it. And thank you, I appreciate that. So Also, if that's Steve excited, then. <laughs> okay. well, uh, well, Steve, I, I understand, I understand <laughs> why he's excited. This strikes at the heart of the issue. If there's a God, we might have some rules to follow. Like this is um, you. We keep trying to make these moral arguments or these theological arguments, but I don't think they agree with you whatsoever. I think it is fully possible that you could believe in a God that both gives us moral rules and a God that has created a 14 billion year old universe. Why do you think that God isn't powerful enough or knowledgeable enough to create a universe that is 14 billion years old and still be able to give us something like the Ten Commandments? I don't understand why this is I impossible to you. Oh, yeah. God, God can certainly do it in 14 billion years if he wants. It doesn't matter. But the God who can create the world can also write a book and tell us how he did it. And the book says 6,000. But the book doesn't say 6,000. You I have mean, to use a lot of commandments. like, you, you've got to use a lot of different passages to get there. Nowhere in the book of Genesis does it say explicitly that one day there is the same day as it would be for man. It also doesn't explicitly say that God created the universe in 6,000 years. You have to rely on a modern interpretation of probably translated texts even in order to get to that 6,000 year figure. I just don't understand why you think it's impossible that God could pass us down moral imperatives and also create a universe that's almost 14 billion years old. I think you could absolutely do both. Just have to mention a quick two minute warning. I know that Kent, your contact uh, mentioned that you have to go pretty quick. So I just want to let you know like two minutes and we should really wrap up. And thank you guys for being so patient. Okay. And being here longer than the power promised hour and 15 minutes. Well, I pointed out at the beginning that the Bible dates do clearly add up to about 4,000 BC. I mean, you can read Genesis five. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Uh, that's it. The Bible clearly teaches man brought death into the world. Nothing died before Adam sinned. Nothing died. I'm curious. And this is a great theological question of you know what happens when we die. If is there a God? If there's no God, Steve, you're, there's no, nothing to worry about. If if there's no God, I have nothing to worry about. I've lived a wonderful life. I enjoy my life. I enjoy living. I enjoy my teaching. I enjoy dinosaur adventure land in Lenox, Alabama. I'm having a wonderful time and. I'm going to heaven when I die. If it turns out it's not true and I go to the grave and rot, okay, I still had a wonderful time. I enjoyed it. It's a win-win. It's Pascal's wager, of course. But I think you're in a win-lose situation here. Might want to think about that. Well, um, fuck, I don't even remember. Or I don't even remember my original question now. I'm um, sorry, keep going. Or what was the <laughs> next question? Uh, we With that, I, I think that if you want to give like a, a last like uh, goodbye, you could say, well, we'll probably wrap up just because... Uh, we want to say thanks for everybody being patient as it's uh, this has been a wild one. This has been exciting, though. It's been immensely interesting. So uh, 
Yeah. If you had anything, Destiny, otherwise if, uh, we can uh, wrap her up. Um, no, I think I'm good. I mean, I, I still feel like I didn't get any evidence. I was kind of hoping that I could kind of tear through some evidence um, for the positive case. It's always harder to defend a positive than it is to just kind of critique um, to, to critique another person's positive. And I feel like somehow I got roped into defending um, pretty obscure, <laughs> you know, physics equations and whatnot here. Um, I think it would be really interesting sometime to hear the evidence for a 6,000 year old Earth rather, rather than correctly pointing out the limitations of some of the tools that we not only use, but scientists acknowledge have limitations um, to, to measure some of the things that we have on Earth today. But maybe for another day. Maybe, who knows, maybe a round two or something. Uh, we've enjoyed it yeah, a lot. I'll do it. Anytime, anytime. And uh, thank you, Shannon. Shannon's had a hard job today uh, because basically I need to do a better job of letting people know like, hey, we're going to let the audience know that we'll only read questions that are relevant to the topic, stuff like that. That um, I just want to say thanks for your help, Shannon. And uh, she is linked now in the description as well, <laughs> in addition to the two speakers. So thank you guys for being here. We also want to just mention today is a crazy day we are excited we have two scholars dr michael brown is going to debate dr josh from the channel digital hammurabi that's today that's at 6 p.m eastern standard time today and it's going to be epic so it's going to be a lot of fun hopefully uh, we'll see you there and otherwise just want to mention again that we really appreciate our debaters coming on today we really appreciate both destiny or, or steven and uh, kent being willing to uh, stay longer as well so with that we hope everybody takes care and has a great day. Thanks for stopping by and keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you guys for coming here. It's been a total pleasure. And I know that you guys went along, so I appreciate that. I, uh, if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know because uh it was a wild one today but hopefully you guys enjoyed it i had a blast please come down to visit dinosaur adventure land uh shannon steve come down i'll give you a tour you can ask any questions that we want and uh take your for a tour around the place i think you'll enjoy our creation-based dinosaur adventure land well i'm in nova scotia canada so it's a bit of a haul for me but <laughs> i'll keep it <laughs> keep in mind if i have ever the opportunity i will take you up on that kent i'll be there I'll okay see. you're on all right thank you so much bye-bye <laughs> see you later take care Yep, see ya. Thanks so much. That was a wild one. Shannon, I'm seriously sorry, I guess. I didn't uh, want to ask James because there was a list of questions that weren't pertaining to the topic. I was told not to ask questions that didn't pertain to the topic, so I improvised and asked a question. I know. That was you a did a good job. Steve's earlier I'm, questions. I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to be staring blankly into space. To, I know <laughs> you're right. To be honest, it was just that I could tell that Kent was suspicious of you from the start. I don't so really I, care. I, I didn't well, <laughs> That's, I just wanted him to know that, like, that I was trying to keep it as fair as possible and that you didn't have, even what though you're... What, what alternative would you have proposed to me in that situation? You didn't do anything wrong. You did everything. You were very rational and kind, and, and that's why I felt kind of bad for, like, asking you, like, in front of people if you'd be willing to not um, do that. So I'm sorry. I would have had I had an alternative. I would have chosen the alternative. You didn't do anything wrong. I'm sorry. I'm honestly kind of learning as I go. But Stephen, okay. thanks so much. We appreciated it. I hope you... Uh, it's definitely Kent Hovind is a character. I think it reminded me of your discussion that I watched with Jesse Lee Peterson, Stephen, where I was yeah, like, you don't know, bit, if, yeah. you don't know if the person's trolling. Sometimes I think Kent, I think, is like trolling. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't, I don't. Uh, too, it's hard to tell if he argues in good faith or bad faith. I, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I mean, when you're that old and you've been religious for that long, um, I, I mean, it's really hard to let go of it. I mean, even at my age, I guess, if I was 30 and I'd been religious the whole time, um, I, I, it would probably be pretty hard to let go of your religion. You'd basically have to admit that everything you've done in your entire life has been ideologically ungrounded. So, I mean, that would be pretty tough for a lot of people to do, I think. He also runs a compound where people live in almost cult-like status. <laughs> oh, well, you know, that's... So, yeah, he's, he's fully invested. Uh, I'm, it was very nice to meet you, Stephen. I haven't met you before, so yeah, it, I thanks. appreciate it. And I, I do have to run. I actually have an event that I have to go to. So it was a pleasure, James. We're good. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you didn't <laughs> do anything so wrong. I'm sorry <laughs> that I didn't fill you in better and, and that it was just kind of, it was a hard thing of like, so Live debates are never easy and never without a bump.
So that's what makes them fascinating and interesting. And that's why I always enjoy them. So it was nice to meet you, Stephen. And as always, it's a pleasure, James. I'm sorry I have to hop off. And hopefully I will see you both again. See you later. All right. Have fun, guys. Peace out. Take care. Have a great time, Stephen. Yep. It's been fun, man. I'll see you later. All right. Bye-bye. You started doing really well towards the middle. I, I, I don't know how to debate the obscure, like, orbital mechanic physics of the moon. I, like, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we did really well towards, like, the middle. Um, towards the middle and the end, I think, was, like, really good. I, getting, like, super hung up on the moon, I think, was maybe a mistake. Maybe I should have moved on a little quicker from that topic. Um, the uh, I'm pretty sure the the only thing the inverse square law is is that like if you have something that originates from a point um, as you move farther away it becomes like exponentially less impactful so like if you have a beam of light here and you move like twice as far away it's like two times two well that's a bad example because it's two but like if you move like three times away or whatever it becomes like exponentially less bright not just three times less bright but like to the power of whatever oh shit sorry you're fucked. There you go. Yeah, two times two is two. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, but like, yeah, so like this is really relevant when you're talking about things like lighting or when you're talking about things like um, like gravitational fields, um, right? Because like a gravitational field is more intense, but then it radiates outwards and it becomes less intense. But when it comes to things like orbiting the planet, there's a lot more that impacts that than just the inverse square law. Um, in fact, um, I don't even know. Um, I don't even know if the inverse square law has much to do with spoil or not spoilers. Fuck, has much to do with um, orbits. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it. I guess it probably does, right? Um, if you're orbiting a really massive body at some given speed, the more gravity the body has, probably the more delta v you would need to change your orbit. I guess is how it would impact it probably um inverse square law doesn't work for close orbital mechanics yeah i just i don't think it would um i don't think it would be relevant to um to the 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 change in how the moon leaves the planet because there's so much else going on related to tidal forces and the changing earth he kept doing the two body problem perfect sphere shit that simply isn't valid in real cases yeah like if his thing if he was just talking about two bodies that were like stationary or one was orbiting the other and there was no change between either of these bodies or impact from anywhere else then yeah i'm also not sure if jupiter impacts like moon and earth stuff as well i think isn't jupiter like so fucking huge that like every calculation you do like in our star system you kind of have to account for where jupiter is and everything because it fucks everything too like yeah I, yeah i don't know there's like or like all of that shit in space is like those calculations are very very complicated and highly like interdependent on a whole bunch of other things so i don't know i don't know i don't know why well, was scared scared about talking about his dissertation did he drop out oh he's actually he actually won't release it wait where is it oh but i found it um, Kent Hovind is a well-known young earth biblical creationist and such the strength of his dissertation is a broad interest. According to our own source, contrary to accepted practices in academia where doctoral dissertations are available to the public, Kent Hovind, along with his alma mater, Patriot Bible University, has consistently refused to allow his dissertation to be offered for public reprint or scholarly inquiry. That school is a diploma mill. Nice. His university isn't even a real university. I don't, I don't know anything about it. Here you go. I'll link this though. Maybe you should have played Kerbal to prepare. Um, I played Kerbal quite a bit, but Kerbal doesn't actually do multiple body problems. I think it's too complicated. In Kerbal, um, only one planet can be affecting your gravitational or your orbit at any given point in time. Multiple planets don't affect your gravity in, or your multiple planets do not impact your orbits in Kerbal Space Program unless they changed it. Okay, so the people that drove the planes of the 9-11 towers, those guys benefited from spirituality. Would most people benefit from spirituality from them?